Hi, so in this video, I'll talk about network-based defenses for malware. Uh, in, in the previous video, I kind of alluded to the, the idea that this is going to happen because I talked about sandboxing and emulation. And in here, we're, we're going to talk about using some of these techniques, but at the network level. Now, at first, this might sound like a bit of an oxymoron. After all, malware resides in the endpoint, and that's really where the damage is done. Uh, however, there are some cases, um, or maybe some instances, in which you can do some stuff at the network level. And, and to be clear, um, these aren't things that are uh, exclusive to the network level or to exclusive network monitoring, uh, but there might be some reasons to consider them. For example, um, easy deployment. So there have been a number of technologies out there and some vendors who have uh, been providing solutions for uh, so-called network-based defenses. Uh, now let me actually first tackle what it is that these technologies actually do. So imagine you have uh, an enterprise network, and, and let me... Uh, assign some color stuff. So you've got a bunch of systems here on an enterprise network. And these systems are uh, communicating outside the network to the internet. So they may be, they may be communicating outside the network uh, to the internet at large. And, and we'll draw the internet as a classic uh, cloud. Okay, so maybe this is the internet. And you have systems on the enterprise network that are communicating to the internet. Okay, now network-based uh, malware defense devices, and, and these are typically thought of as actual devices, will reside right here in between that connection. They're basically going to reside uh, at the point or somewhere that would be an enterprise gateway, and they're going to basically listen to the traffic, and in some cases they may even get in the way of traffic, but for the most part, um, I'll be talking about malware defense solutions that can just kind of listen to traffic. So imagine a, a device of some sort, and it's typically a hardware device, and uh, this device will just listen in on the network traffic between these endpoints and the internet at large. Then what are they going to be doing? Well, one's going to, they're going to monitor network traffic. Okay, and sometimes network traffic might be indicative of something malicious happening on a computer, uh, an actual endpoint. So for example, imagine you see a lot of traffic that goes over IRC and that seems to be um, that seems to involve commands like a botnet type of command. So for example, you might have a botnet at the computer, it's communicating to a command and control server, and the actual communication patterns could be a telltale sign that a botnet, um, that botnet communications are taking place. So that's an example of some type of, of network type traffic. And of course, you could monitor that on the endpoint, uh, but you can also see that on the network. Um, and then for specific protocols, maybe for HTTP or FTP, or maybe a handful of protocols, the network device might recognize that um, as part of the network payload, maybe there's a file somewhere being transmitted as part of the payload. So maybe it's a file that's being either downloaded, uh, typically being downloaded from the internet to a particular device. And what these uh, network-based malware defense solutions will do is they will basically take, they will strip out the binary contents of this file from the actual network payload. They will then take that file and run it inside the device in a sandboxed or emulated environment and then make a determination about whether that file is malicious. Okay, so this is, and, and really the techniques here are, are the core techniques I talked about earlier in, in some of the previous videos. For example, uh, signatures, heuristics, behavior, and that includes not just regular behavior, but, but um, uh, the manifestation of that behavior in terms of network traffic. And again, that is something you could monitor on the endpoint. Uh, these guys are just doing it at the network level. Now, because this type of approach is being implemented at the network level, it has some benefits with respect to deployment. So for example, you can have a single device and you just deploy it in one place on the network and it effectively will cover everybody who is on that network. So the idea is that everyone who's on this network will be um, protected to some degree by this box. Now, and I say to some degree, obviously, it, it, this is not a perfect solution and there really is no such thing as a silver bullet. So let me actually talk about some of the, the limitations of network-based solutions. So uh, the first thing, the biggest limitation, and you might have figured this out, is that there's no remediation capability. In other words, uh, these devices are good at identifying, or they can identify malware, but they uh, may not be able to actually get rid of it. They can kind of point to the fire, but they can't actually put it out, so to speak. Uh, and that's because they don't reside on the endpoint. So they have no ability, if, if there's some malware right here on the system, all, all this device can tell you is that, hey, there's something bad on that system, but it can't actually get rid of that bad file for you because it doesn't reside on the endpoint. At best, maybe you can try to tear down uh, TCP traffic or, or some type of traffic between 
this system and the rest of the internet, but that's uh, um, that, that's a pretty limited capability. Uh, the second thing is that there is no protection of remote devices. So remote devices are not handled. And that's actually pretty critical in today's world where people often, what will often happen is somebody might, you know, they'll go home, let's say they, they go to their house, and let's say this guy goes home, and maybe he gets infected at home. Okay, and maybe he goes and he goes on his own computer, he's checking his email from home, and lo and behold, he gets infected, and then he shows back up at the enterprise, and now he is uh, communicating infected traffic out of the enterprise. So in other words, when he's at home, he's technically not on the enterprise network, and therefore not under the purview of the uh, network-based malware defense mechanism. Okay. The third thing is that uh, network traffic might be encrypted. And this is very common along, among many pieces of malware. Uh, and, and that's actually a big concern because if the network traffic is encrypted, then you A, you can't glean anything from it by what's happening at the network level, so you can't just monitor the network traffic. Uh, and perhaps, you know, equally as important, um, if you you'll have no way of identifying because there's a file right here that's being transmitted and this file happens to be going over an encrypted connection, there'll be no way for the device to be able to figure out there's a file being transmitted. All it's, all it's going to see is some kind of random looking text. Okay. Uh, the fourth thing is that uh, network-based devices, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, they have a kind of a sacrificial lamb quality to them. In other words, uh, because they're not actually blocking malware because they're actually at best they're going to emulate the file before they can say anything and there's going to be a delay while they're emulating so let's say they see a, a file let's say this guy sees this file here and um, he, you know, he copies the file over and he starts emulating it um, this emulation process might take 30 seconds a minute two minutes five minutes some amount of time and during that time in which it's being emulated this file is going to go onto the network it's going to go onto the endpoint device it's going to start wreaking havoc there uh, in that time, and, and you never really, you, you've allowed at least one person to get infected. Now, in the future, if you see this file again, then yes, it can be blocked. Let's say that if this particular user gets this file, um, then there's at least some hope of blocking it because um, we have already known it to be malicious from the previous trial. But again, in, in a world where, um, especially in a world where there's so much polymorphism, so many ways to modify files, um, if you're missing it the first time, you, you may never see that file again. And so, um, you, you're always allowing with a network-based solution somebody to get infected first uh, before you, know, you can do anything about the problem. And then that first person might be some sort of sacrificial lamb uh, in that scenario, in that context. Uh, the fifth thing is that uh, a lot of pieces of malware can do what's called sandbox evasions. In other words, some malware can detect if it's running inside of a sandbox. Uh, and obviously, if you're running type of a sandbox environment, you're, you're running, it's not a natural environment. This thing is not running willy-nilly on a computer. It's running inside of an emulator that's actually executing the instructions. And obviously, an emulated environment is different. Some pieces of malware can detect that they're running inside of an emulated environment. Typically, it's, it's detecting via means of, of, of timing mechanisms, or maybe there are certain APIs that... Uh, that a piece of malware will get access to when they're inside of a network-based or inside of a, a, a sandbox, but they won't necessarily have access to outside of a sandbox. And so uh, they, they can try certain things out. If those things work, that they'll know that they're, they're running inside of a sandbox. And as a result, they may behave differently when they're running in a sandbox. Some malware will decide, you know what, I'm not going to do anything malicious if I'm running in a sandbox. And so none of these behavioral techniques will pick that up, and the file will kind of go through. It'll look like it's legitimate. And you know maybe it'll go ahead and it's going to infect this guy because um, in the sandbox itself it looked benign because the, the malware knew it was in a sandbox and proceeded to do nothing in that time. But then once the file actually got on the endpoint, it started doing some real damage. And again, that's really what, why you need endpoint level visibility um, in many cases to deal with malware. Uh, and, and that's actually the last point, which is that there's no endpoint level visibility. And that's actually a critical point because um, the reality is that Malware might behave differently when it's in the sandbox. It might behave differently on, on different endpoints. Uh, and sometimes, it, for whatever reason, if a malware is actually running directly on an endpoint, it might, based on the configuration of the endpoint, do a certain set of actions. And perhaps those are the actions that you can use to identify that the thing is malicious. But if you don't see those actions, you'll have no uh, mechanism by which to identify the thing is malicious, and, and you'll miss it. So um, you really need that level of endpoint visibility if you want to be able to identify um, that something is malware when it's running on the endpoint. 
And then the last thing, and I'm not going to write this down really, is that there's, there's just some general sandbox efficacy issues. And, and sometimes what will happen is um, when you're doing things behavioral, when you're doing things like behavioral detection, um, sometimes uh, if you're concerned about false positives, a lot of times people will um, titrate that detection. So they'll basically make it super conservative and titrate it down so it's, it's rarely going to detect anything just because they're so worried about it detecting something that's actually clean by accident. And so they end up titrating the results considerably. And that's just because they have less visibility in the sandbox. Obviously, if you're at the endpoint, you, you have more uh, signals, so to speak, because you were seeing that thing run in its native environment. You'll have more information to go off of to make a determination about efficacy. But if you're running on a network device, since you don't have that level of visibility, you may have to be more conservative. And, and what, what often happens is these guys tend to uh, be conservative to avoid FPs. So they don't want to actually have false positives. And, and as a result, they're going to take a conservative stance to avoid them. So network-based approaches to, to malware defense, I and mean, one of the, the benefits of them, as I mentioned earlier, is that you can deploy them anywhere. You can drop them on your network, and then they'll monitor everything that's on that network. So it's a pretty easy deployment scenario. Uh, and then there are some limitations, and, and so the first major limitation would be that there's no remediation capabilities. In other words, um, you can point to the fire, but it can't get rid of the uh, the malware itself. Uh, it doesn't handle remote devices, so if somebody is not on the enterprise network, maybe they're at home and get infected at home, which is quite common, uh, then you won't be able to protect them uh, in that scenario. So they're only going to be there for, it's only going to work when somebody's directly on the enterprise network. Uh, the third thing is that these approaches don't handle encrypted network traffic, so um, uh, they don't handle the ability to, uh, to to deal with things that are encrypted. And not only that, but they may not also handle other protocols. I mean, typically, these things are um, uh, limited to what other protocols they can handle. So for example, some of these devices may only handle HTTP. Others may handle uh, TCP and uh, FTP and a few others. But maybe they don't handle some other critical protocol by which network traffic is is traversing um, out from a device to the internet. Uh, the fourth thing is that uh, these devices are, allow for sacrificial lambs. In other words, there's always a possibility that somebody will, actually a very real possibility that somebody will get infected first, and then only after that person's already been infected and damage has been done will that same threat be prevented from going on future machines, but at least one person is going to get infected by them. Uh, the fifth thing is that there's possibility of sandbox evasion. And um, as a result, you might have malware that can detect that's running in a sandbox. Uh, and then also, there's no endpoint level visibility. In other words, um, you're not actually seeing what's happening on the endpoint. And that kind of leads to the final, the final aspect of things, which is that these things are going to be conservative, typically, to avoid false positives, just because they have uh, less visibility and as such are going to be more conservative. And they may miss a lot of malware. They may try to their detection capabilities down so much that they'll miss a lot of malware in the process. So hope that made some sense to you, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in future videos.